It's one of the first pieces of advice I give to anyone playing music or writing music for bells. Play upside down. I don't mean that you should literally hang upside down from inside a bell, but I had to try it just to be sure. No, by play upside down, I mean you should flip the arrangement, the voicing. Switch which register is taking the melody or the harmony. Focus not on the soprano or the treble bells for the melody, but the tenor or the bass bells. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. Bells that are lower in pitch are bigger. And bigger bells are just louder and more resonant. Compare the biggest bell in this tower, weighing 12,000 pounds, to the smallest, weighing just 20 pounds. Notice how that big bell is still ringing, but the smaller bell, its sound was gone in just a second. And I'm recording this up in the tower. If you're a block away listening, that smallest bell might not even reach you. It's one reason why the top octave here is a little bit superfluous. Most bell towers don't actually have this top octave. Even a full-sized instrument is considered full-size without that octave. And yeah, it's fun to flourish up there. But I would never try to carry a melody up in that register. Especially if I'm playing bass notes underneath that melody, It just doesn't work that well. Now, if I drop the melody two octaves to be right at the top of the treble clef staff, or even a little bit above the treble clef staff, then it can work. Though I have to be a little bit careful with my bass and my harmony and not play them too loud. But not every tower's bells are this capable. These are modern Dutch bells, only 25 years old. When these bells were cast, Eijbouts, the bell founder, had pretty much mastered a problem that had plagued bell founders for centuries, which is how to get the treble bells to sound stronger, louder, and more resonant. Their solution? Basically make them thicker without lowering their pitch to get more vibrating mass. But when I was playing at Yale or in Chicago with bells that were made by English bell founders in the 1960s or the 1930s, well, those treble bells can't really carry a melody very well. And don't get me wrong, those instruments are incredible. The English bass bells by Taylor and Gillett and Johnston are really unmatched in their tone and their character. But these towers, with weaker trebles, especially benefit from flipping the music upside down. Even on modern instruments that have very resonant trebles, like here in Denver, it still is true that the bigger bells are just going to carry a melody better than the higher bells. They're bigger bells. So we should try putting melodies in the tenor. or even in the bass, maybe even forgoing any bass notes below that melody and have the melody be the bass. It takes a little getting used to playing this way. On a carillon, it means playing melodies with your left hand or with your feet, having your hands play the rhythmic accompaniment more softly. Okay, so if you're writing music or playing music on bells, it's easy to fall into this trap and play right side up with the melody on top. Because when making an arrangement, we often start with a piano score. And if you take a look at a piano arrangement of a pop song, it probably has you playing the melody with your right hand in the top voice. It works well on the piano, but when playing the carillon, it's easy to forget this first piece of advice. Play it upside down. Sometimes this means I'm actually reading off a piano score flipped. I'm reading the top line and playing at an octave lower with my feet, and I'm reading the bottom line and playing at an octave higher with my hands. It took me some practice to be able to play that way, but it's a pretty useful trick to pull out when I need to. Actually, Coldplay songs are great examples of songs that should be flipped upside down because their harmony is so rhythmic and textured, and the treble bells, while they can't carry a melody as well, they do a great job of executing faster rhythms.
Now, we can't play every song upside down. Songs with fast, intricate melodies might be a little too muddy to be flipped. But if I'm right side up, playing the melody on top with bass bells underneath, then I'm taking care not to play the harmony or the bass bells too loud to not overpower the melody. Okay, so let's say we have a song that can be flipped upside down. Should we do it? Maybe, but I don't flip every song upside down. It's important not to vary just our repertoire, but also our playing style. If I took every song down into the bass or the tenor all the time, it would just get a little boring. Actually, a style of arranging that I really like is to start right side up for a verse and a chorus or two, but then at the bridge or the last chorus, then flip it upside down. I do that all the time. I have so many videos on this channel where I use that technique. Just to give a few examples, there's Charlie Chaplin's Smile, starts right side up. Then ends upside down. Or Leonard Cohen's Alleluia, right side up. And then upside down. Disney songs are great examples too, like Colors of the Wind. Or I Won't Say I'm in Love from Hercules. Or even I Won't Talk About Bruno from Encanto. Writing music upside down applies to folk songs too. Some of the greatest composers for Tower Bells taught me this trick through their own music. Take Milford Meyer, one of the legends of North American carillon playing and repertoire. We could look at almost anything he's written and see this trick. The melody is in the bass the entire time. Or how about Sally Slade Warner, another icon of Tower Bell music? Take her arrangement of La Vie en Rose. Notice how she doesn't need much more than just the melody when it's in the bass. Actually, earlier on in the arrangement, she starts in the treble bells, but it's still upside down because she has two harmony notes that are just above the melody. And if you're writing music for tower bells, well, thinking upside down can go a long way. Consider one of the most iconic composers for Carillon, Ronald Barnes. His prelude, one of my favorites to play for celebratory occasions. The melody stays in the bass 90% of the time, while the rhythmic drive is up in the trebles. Okay, so these were just a few examples of how to think upside down when writing music or when playing music off a lead sheet or a piano score. So, next time you're listening to the bell tower, try to pick out when the bell tower is playing music right side up or flipping music on its head and playing upside down.